Laura McDonald. She is the commercial account executive at ThoughtSpot, and her talk today is They're Banking on Us, How Neobanks Are Gaining Market Share. She joins us today to bring a fresh perspective on neobank trends in financial services space today. Although she studied French at university, spending time and living working in Paris, Laura's interest in this dynamic area stemmed from her early career experiences in Bloomberg. Since joining ThoughtSpot in 2019, she's developed a particular interest in working with data-centric neobanks and fintechs across Europe who need a business user-friendly analytics solution for all levels of the organization to quickly act on the vast amounts of customer data they collect on a daily basis. Laura will speak about how neobanks are leveraging data to unlock customer loyalty, and no doubt she'll fit, she'll fit in one or two of her infamous puns. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and bring Laura up on our virtual stage. Hello, Laura, welcome to the Dedicated Conference. Hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me okay, just to check that first of all? Absolutely, we can hear you, we can see you. I'm going to hop off the virtual stage and let you take it away and I'll jump back in about 10 minutes. Perfect, thank you, Kate. And it is a true pleasure to be here with you all today at the Datacated conference. Now I'm here in the ThoughtSpot European headquarters in the city of London, which is the pulsing heart of the financial services industry with Bloomberg, Lloyds, uh, BlackRock, who you just heard a, a great presentation from Tiffany on, is just around the corner. Now, these corporations are the cornerstone of the traditional financial services industry, but there is a global trend that is sweeping around the world and disrupting the status quo. It's a trend which has a market share of $27 billion, has tripled in growth since 2017, and that thrives off momentous volumes of app-driven consumer data. It's the tidal wave rise of the neobank. And in the next 10 minutes, I'll be fin serving up to you why data is critical for these neobanks to gain the market share of consumer loyalty. For context, as Kate mentioned, I work for ThoughtSpot, the analytics solution who pioneered search and AI-driven analytics to enable business people, not just data experts, to have a fluid conversation and ask and answer questions of data stored in a cloud data warehouse without heavy reliance on technical teams. And also what we hear from our traditional financial services customers like Nationwide Building Society or National Australia Bank is the need to really digitally transform as these new digital native neobanks enter onto the scene and raise the bar in terms of how they're using and monetizing data. Now, Thomas Mazzaferro, who's the Chief Data Officer at Western Union, actually spoke to us about how they've seen 100% year-on-year growth of their digital platforms in the first two quarters of 2020, which, especially with the context of the pandemic, demonstrates this consumer shift to managing independently their own finances via a digital platform. So what exactly is a neobank? Well, they're typically launched post 2010. They're cloud native, they're accessible through a mobile application. And all of this means is that they are digitally native by nature. And so they're able to track and harness huge volumes of consumer interaction data through these mobile devices, which with the right backend and front-end technology, they are able to harness across the organization and really drive that product iteration to gain the market share of consumer loyalty. So let's explore together three key areas where data is being, is being used to drive business point decisions. Consumer-focused product design, integrity as an asset, and innovation. So we talk about understanding what the consumer wants. But it's not just using data to understand what they want. It's using this data across the organization. Because if you think about the marketplace, neobanks are acting in a very, very saturated space. There's maybe 300 of them worldwide. So having a clear understanding of what the product needs to achieve and who it's targeting is critical for the growth and success of these organizations. And if we look at how they're actually organized in terms of the structure of the organization, what we often see is roles from traditional business units, so sales, marketing, R&D, 
actually forming part of a cross-functional product team centered around one or more products. And by products here, we mean uh, a debit card, a credit card, a savings account accessible through these mobile applications. So empowering these product teams with the freedom and ability to interact and ask questions off a centrally governed non-silo data source encourages this collaboration between the team members and allows them to faster get to the answer to important questions like, in which direction do we take our product? In which order do we prioritize iterations? And will this change negatively affect the consumer experience? And the consumer experience, thinking about how we live in a kind of instant gratification society is especially key in this area. Because what we see is the more intuitive, the simpler the user interface, the more likely to retain that customer on their product and their application. So having these kind of reporting and, and data feeds that give visibility into the changing dynamics of the marketplace and consumer wants is not just important for the product design, but also the general strategy of the company. So if we take an example from France, uh, there's a company called Vibe, which is a, a near bank who specifically target the 12 to 17 market segment. Now they've amassed a consumer base of over 1.5 million customers already since their launch in 2019, which is a clear example of how they're using data to consistently and successfully reiterate a product that's specifically designed for a certain market segment. On the other hand, what Kantar says is that for near banks to grow their share of the electronic uh, wallet, they really do need to diversify their portfolio. And I'm actually working with a, uh, one of the fastest growing Swedish near banks who are looking to expand out into 10 different EU countries in the next five years. So they're now adapting their data and reporting feeds internally so that these product teams and senior leadership are actually now doing cross analysis across their product portfolio to understand which options to give versus which new products to launch in different geographies, depending on the consumer uh, trends within that geographical space. So this is talking about using data for, for product iteration in response to consumer demand. But another trend that we're seeing in this area is using data to understand how to leverage integrity as an asset. Now, what does that mean? Well, Neobank and uh, FinTech founders were particularly galvanized by the consumer trends to give their business to organizations which adopt ESG frameworks, so uh, environmental, social, and governance, which are particularly popular with millennials or uh, the Gen Z. So Tomorrow, for example, which is a near bank based out of Germany, they're offering to their customers a wooden debit card compared with single use plastic. And they're actually investing back into sustainable bonds. And they've already done about $4.3 million worth of investment into renewable energies. So using data to firstly understand the ESG impact of the organization and then correlating this with customer acquisition is helping the marketing and strategy teams understand which consumer segment to target who are most likely to give their business to a banking provider who shares their values. Now, we mentioned earlier on the challenge for near banks to really excel in this in this saturated market space. And what we're sometimes seeing is that there is a tendency to over pivot in terms of pure growth and consumer ac customer acquisition at the expense of profitability. But what we're seeing, and there's a really interesting article actually by Octopus Ventures on this, is that ESG stocks actually display more uh, resilience to economic shocks and are less volatile to their conventional counterparties. So if near banks are tapping into this space, they're looking at both potentially gaining consumer uh, demand and customer acquisition, and also potentially being more attractive to investment and VC funding. Now, we can't ever talk about data and analytics without mentioning the third uh, umbrella term and buzzword in the industry of innovation, which is critical for near banks not only to expand on their core offerings, but develop a unique combination of products and services that really helps drive that disruption in the marketplace. 
Now, one of the things that we're starting to see in, in both customers and in the market in general is creating new revenue streams by monetizing data for uh, third parties or partner organizations. So to, to give you an example, MasterCard have a specific data and services arm who are doing exactly this. And they've actually embedded ThoughtSpot into a uh, customer facing portal to allow their corporate customers to use the, the search and the AI functionality to have a personalized and sophisticated way of analyzing consumer payment flows to faster understand how these are operating and where to make changes to get to the money faster. Now, innovation also comes with a real focus on time to market and how quickly can you innovate and bring something new to the forefront. So especially looking at the neobank context where everything has to act with agility, it's a very, very digitally driven, uh, fast world they're operating in. And what we heard from uh, Marcos Peralta, who, to use this MasterCard example, is the senior vice president for this MasterCard data and services arm, is that it's now super easy for his developer team to build these what we call interactive data apps that they were actually able to do in, in one day what had taken them two years to build internally to bring visualizations and interactivity to their data. And that's his words, not mine. But if we translate this into a neobank context, partnering with different organizations and different technologies to help expedite on bringing new services and new innovations to market is also going to help not just drive that consumer and customer acquisition, but potentially present new ways of making that shift to profitability. And really this... Uh, Oh, keep going. I just wanted to let you know we're, we're close to time and I want to take questions, but keep going, Laura. Yeah, perfect. That's no problem. I've almost finished. Because uh, what we ha have to mention, of course, is internal innovation as, as well in the way that companies are using data across the organization. And we're seeing this shift from taking that heavy lifting away from building and reporting and siloed ownership of the data to create a really fluid discussion across the organization and innovate internally and not just externally. So what have we learned today or what hopefully have you learned today? Clearly, simply having and consolidating data is not enough of a USP for neobanks who are at that inflection point of growth with data as the fuel to drive this in the right direction, whether that's niche market segment, wider portfolio, continuing the focus on customer acquisition or making that shift to profitability. But with this need to innovate at speed and act with agility, it will be those companies who are thinking differently, perhaps, about how to use data within and outside of the organization who are going to win the race in this perpetual need to gain more customers, even across national boundaries, and be able to successfully make that shift from growth to data-driven profitability. So I'm super excited to... Uh, bring Kate back in uh, and take questions from the audience. And of course, it goes without saying that if anyone's interested in hearing more about ThoughtSpot, you now also know where to where to find me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura, for the presentation. We have questions flowing in. That's why I jumped, jumped in. I want to make sure we can take at least a couple of questions before our time is up. Please. So I'll jump right into it. Um, Albert here has a question. He's saying, you know, Laura, what are the limitations of neobanks? And how could they be made more useful to customers? Yeah, great question, Albert, thank you. I think one of the limitations of, of neobanks is because they've started out in uh, usually kind of just as we mentioned, this focus on pure customer acquisition at the expense of profitability. When they're looking at uh, coming up against these, what we call the incumbent banks, so the, the larger, much more established financial organizations, they have a much uh, bigger wealth that they're able to deploy quickly to, you know, as we've just seen with MasterCard, they've created their own data and services arm, for example. So I think one of the limitations of the neobanks is potentially not being able to keep up with the disruption that they've caused and eventually be taken back over by the incumbent banks, which is actually quite interesting. And this kind of flows into your second point of how can they be made useful to customers is what we're seeing as well as the larger 
corporations actually partnering with these near banks so that they can bring the sort of digitally focused, uh, you know, innovative mindset from near banks coupled with, you know, the established uh, growth of the FinServe and create a real, um, you know, 360 now digitally native offering to customers. Uh, thank you so much for that. And I think you might have sort of touched on this in the first question, but there's another question from Kimberly that asks this a, a slightly different way. So she asks that uh, given that neobanks are digitally native by nature, do you see neobanks pushing out traditional uh, banks or moving towards neobank formats? And she's sensing a lot of M&A activity uh, our way. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Kimberly, I would I would completely agree with you. There is a, a huge amount of M&A activity that we're seeing in the in the, in the marketplace and not just m a in terms of larger banks actually you know acquiring smaller banks but in some cases like rbs for example is another one of the the companies we work with and they've actually developed their own near bank called uh, nettle so they've actually taken what is happening in the marketplace and they haven't acquired another company they've actually um, you know created their own arm so there's different ways in which I think the incumbent banks are approaching, you know, this this challenger wave, and it's either looking at that, okay, how can we collaborate together, um, or how can we take what's happening and develop our own version of this. So it's a kind of interesting space to watch, and I think one of the, you know, the 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 challenges that we'll see for near banks going forward and how they bring this into their operating model. Yeah, absolutely, definitely an interesting place to watch and. Laura, thank you so much for providing a, a truly fresh perspective to our conference. I uh, really, really enjoyed your presentation and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for, for tuning in.